The AI regulation in Europe is incredibly stupid. And Ursula von der Leyen in her State of Europe address this year was like, Europe is saving humanity from extinction with the AI Act, and the rest of the world should follow. It's like, what, what have you been smoking? Any of those lines? You can't be a powerful, prosperous country in the 21st century if you don't get AI right. AI is not just another technology. AI is the automation of intelligence. The way democracy works today made sense in the 18th century. You vote once every four years. This is ridiculous. Voting is, is quite smart in some ways. But we have AI now. The algorithm that can make the decisions can be way better than this, in ways that we don't even imagine. So I think in the future, we are going to want the important decisions to be made by algorithms. And God help us if the algorithm isn't making a decision. There's already a lot of people saying like, oh, AIs are going to be conscious, therefore they must have rights. My position on that is that you must be insane if you think machines should have rights. Who are you? Uh, my name is Pedro Domingos. Uh, I'm a professor of computer science. Um, I live in Seattle. My specialty is AI and in particular machine learning. So as you can guess, I'm having an exciting time these days. Yeah. <laughs> very, very exciting time. But I want to, I heard you talking about the AI regulation in Europe that you think is very stupid that they did what they did. And I'm curious to hear more about that. Yes, you're right. The AI regulation in Europe uh, is incredibly stupid. <laughs> uh, Europe has a good track record of producing stupid legislation, but you know, the AI Act is just on another level. Uh, so congratulations to the European Union and its legislators. So um, where to even begin? First of all, the idea of regulating AI as AI makes no sense. Uh, it's like, like regulating mathematics. We don't regulate mathematics because it might be used for bad purposes or regulating a programming language. We don't regulate Python right? Or even regulating quantum mechanics. It's like, oh, quantum mechanics can be used to make nuclear bombs. We've got to put some guardrails on it right now. It just doesn't make sense. AI is a fundamental technology. The right approach uh, is to regulate specific applications, you know, according to the problems in the application area, like self-driving cars can be regulated as cars, right? They're different because they're driven by computers. So that's some interesting issues medical applications, et cetera, et cetera. Trying to have some blanket, you know, agency that regulates all of AI is just a recipe for conflict, you know, bureaucratic duplication, uh, you know, never ending, uh, uh, you know, bureaucracy and, and, and for, uh, for hindering progress. Now that's, that's the first problem. The second problem is then, of course, before you regulate AI, you have to define it. Uh, they define it so broadly that includes almost everything. Uh, uh, like literally, if you look at the letter of the law, everything you do with a computer potentially falls. It's like computer, you know, system used to make decisions like, well, you know, everything does that. Right. So who knows what might, re might be regulated as AI one of these days, because there's always people, you know, eager to regulate more and then take advantage for whatever, uh, you know, purposes they have. Another problem is that AI is 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 evolving very fast. So this idea that we're going to regulate AI now for, you know, the future, for the foreseeable future is just crazy. Like, imagine trying to regulate, you know, the Internet in 1996 when social networks didn't even exist, right? Like, it would be a disaster, right? But, but people now want to regulate AI against super intelligence, which we have no idea what it's going to look like, right? So, you know, we need to, like, you know, let AI develop. And in fact... Some of us warned the European legislatures that by the time the law came out, their definition of AI would be outdated. They went ahead, and a year ago, ChatGPT came out, and then they scrambled to update the definition, leading to a lot of problems. And of course, by the time the law is put in practice, it'll be outdated again. So that's another problem. Now, here's maybe the most shocking part of all of this. So the legislation divides AI applications by risk level. And the highest risk level, or what they consider the highest risk level, is simply outlawed. There's a number of applications of AI that are going to be outlawed in Europe. Like, for example, predictive policing, face recognition, emotion recognition, right? 
Emotion rec imagine you trying to talk with me or anybody without recognizing the emotions on their face, right? That was the recipe for a dysfunctional conversation. But AI, because it's too invasive, is not allowed to read or try to understand your emotions. So you're just condemning AI to be stupid in the name of some, you know, misbegotten notion of privacy. Same with predictive policing. Predictive policing is a wonderful thing. It's predicting where crime is most likely to occur and therefore send the police officers there. This is of great benefit to the potential victims. It lets a smaller police force do the job of a bigger one. Of course, you can have problems, but that's the reason to do it well, not a reason to outlaw it. Okay, and then etc. right? And then it goes down these tiers with, you know, at every level of risk, there's all these reporting requirements and, 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 and um, you know, restrictions and whatnot. Like, for example, they want uh, AI to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, they want AI safety to be tested and assessed and insured by law in ways that not even the Googles and Facebooks know how to do now. They're mandating that a bunch of things be done that nobody actually knows how to do, right? This is just a recipe for, uh, for disaster, right? So at the end of the day, what's going to happen is that, uh, you know, European consumers are going to suffer. Uh, European companies are going to suffer. In particular, European AI startups are going to suffer because the big companies can have all the lawyers and the people to get around these requirements and so on and so forth, but the ones don't. Now, AI is already far behind, in the, sorry, Europe is already far behind in the technology race. Sadly, Europe used to be you know, a leader in AI like America was, and now it's just going to ensure that it's going to become increasingly relevant. I mean, this is going to cost Europe trillions of dollars. It's going to be bad for the quality of life and for the health and, and everything of, of Europeans. And, and it, like, what does it accomplish that is actually useful or positive? I can't name a single thing, so... Uh, that's a very brief summary, although it might seem long, of, of what's wrong with, with the AI Act. Can we do this in the right way or any regulation, anything will be uh, harmful for the long-term potential? As I said, I think regulating AI as AI just makes no sense. This doesn't mean that there are there's no need for regulations on anything, but, but as I said, the right approach is to regulate specific applications in their own right. You regulate medical applications of AI as medical applications. And the issues are completely different from regulating you know, self-driving cars. And in most cases, the fact that something is done with AI does not even affect how it should be regulated. Like for example, if something should be illegal, it should be illegal regardless of whether it's being done with AI. And and, 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 and 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 likewise, if something should be legal, there's no reason why it should be illegal if it's done with AI, right? Now, what so what you need is not some big global or wide, you know, a regulatory agency as people are, are 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 looking at, is for the existing agencies in their domains, transportation, health, etc., to look at what is the impact of AI in their domain and how does it change the way it's regulated now? Because what happens now, and there's certainly a lot to do there is that you know, all the laws and regulations are done with the assumption that decisions are made by humans. Once decisions start being made by AI, a lot of things change. In some cases, you need reg new regulations. In some cases, they need to be different. In some cases, you can actually remove them because there's a presumption of biases and things on the shortcomings and evil intent and, and uh, you know, uh, lack of transparency on people. That is not the case for AI. So this, I think, is the right way to, to, to regulate AI or AI applications. Okay, so as I understand, you think that, let's say, some alt man with shouting, we need more regulations and all this stuff, basically shouting that I don't want competition? Well, there's a, there's a combination of, of players in this game, if you will. Uh, but the first one, I mean, so... There are, <laughs> where to begin? Um, there's a lot of people who are screaming for AI regulation because they honestly believe it's very dangerous, okay? They're not ill-intentioned, they're not corporate shills, they're just a little crazy in my, in my view, right? <laughs> AI has this amazing potential to evoke in us these sci-fi scenarios, right, in Hollywood has fostered that, right? Like when people think of AI, they think of Terminator and Skynet and like, it really AI is not like that, but a lot of people don't understand that, right? And and even, you know, uh, uh, 
and I can see lay people falling into that, but there's even some people who are AI experts who fell into this. And I think partly it's because AI is really a new thing. And we've never seen intelligence before, except in people and, and animals, which in some in that regard are similar. And so anytime you see an intelligent thing like computers being intelligent, you start projecting onto them human characteristics that they just don't have, like free will and emotions and and intentions and and consciousness and blah blah blah. Right? None of that is there. But people can't resist. You know, in the beginning, when you try to chat GPT, you think it's very human, right? Most of that is just being projected by you. After a while, we start to understand that actually it isn't, right? And it's it's good that people are, are doing that learning. But in the in the beginning, people are very easily fooled. Even experts can be fooled. So those people are raising, you know, the alarm. Uh, uh, then there's sort of like the media loves this, right? The media loves alarm stories, right? They're not, you not you don't get headlines saying like, hey, I will not harm anyone. <laughs> <laughs> you can have like saying AI yeah, will extinguish human civilization. And then, of course, this is what people read. So they start to get worried because that's the information they're being fed, right? Now, as you mentioned, there's also another aspect here, which is the incumbents, the big tech companies, have a lot of interest in actually keeping AI closed, right? They, they, you know, like it is well known that in every domain, regulation is to the benefit of the incumbents over the newcomers. And the irony about Europe is that, like, the incumbents are American, and they don't like, you know, the, you know, the power, and, you know, the, that that American companies have. They are, without realizing it, helping them with the AI Act, helping them against the startups that might come from Europe. And so, some of these companies are playing a somewhat cynical game of being in favor of regulation because they know they know how to get around it. Right? You has had previous regulations like the GDPR that have been. Harmful, but largely harmless because, you know, the companies know how to ignore them and pretend, you know, like it's, again, they're so ill-defined that if you're a big company, you have the lawyers to get around this. It, and it's a barrier to entry, like income, it's like barriers to entry, right? And, you know, AI could be very threatening if you, if you leave it open for everybody to do it. So, of course, a lot of, you know, not just companies, but various organizations, you know, like being protective. Also, I think... Uh, um, some of these companies say they're in favor of regulation because they are convinced that regulation is inevitable and they want to have a seat at the table. If they come out saying like, no, we're against it, then they'll be excluded. They say like, yeah, yeah, we're in favor. So they get to shape it, right? It's a very political thing, right? And then there's another one, which, for example, companies like Facebook have learned very well, which is, and I think Google is also learning this, for example, which is, a lot of these decisions around AI are very contentious. And very, you know, people from the left and right will have very opposing views on them. And no matter what you decide, it will be unpopular. And the people who like your decision will take it for granted. The ones who don't like it will hate you for it. So no matter what you do, you'll always wind up less popular. So they just want to offload this to the government. This is why Facebook created this panel to make independent Right, Mark Zuckerberg is not known to be, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, easy on control, right? But like he actually, you know, deliberately gave power away to make a lot of these like sort of content decisions to an independent commission, precisely for that reason. Because now then they they take the blame, right? So there's a number of reasons and a number of players why this, you know, AI regulation is promoted. Unfortunately, none of them are good ones. Uh, uh, you are making a lot of fun of Europe, and uh, since I'm from Europe, <laughs> I I want you. So you think uh, this can play a big role to the to like now? United States is a lot more powerful than Europe, anyways. But you think it will play a big role to Europe going uh, downhill if it doesn't adjust to the AI? Uh, well, yes. So first of all, I'm European as well. I'm originally <laughs> from Portugal. And, and, and the reason I care about what's happening in Europe, and I'm very frustrated by it, is that, you know, I, I, I care. I'm European, right? Most of my American friends, it's like, or Chinese for that matter, it's like, well, Europe is irrelevant. Like, who cares? You know, like, they're gone, right? Never mind. I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not ready to concede that. So, you know, so I care because I'm European. Uh, also, like, there's also around the world, a lot of people, including in America, like in states like California and even now, 
you know, at, at the federal level, who say like, oh, we should follow Europe's example. Right, so 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 the, the the damage that starts in Europe could go beyond Europe. But to answer your question, uh, absolutely. I mean, AI is not just another technology. AI is the automation of intelligence. It's like everything that uses intelligence for, which is just about everything, can in principle, in the short or longer term, be automated with AI. So, whoever is in the lead in AI will be in the lead economically, not just technologically, economically, militarily. Right. China, you know, is going all out. They have a plan. They say we want to, you know, they recognize the importance. They want to be world leaders in AI. They're still behind the West, but they're coming up rapidly. They're going to overtake the West in maybe a decade or so. It depends. In some fields, they already have. In others, it'll take longer. But you can't be a, a, a powerful, prosperous country or economic zone in the 21st century if you don't get AI right. There, there is a lot at stake in this. So you are doing this criticism out of pure love. Well, it's 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 you know I care what happens in Europe, right? And 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 you know first of all I care what happens anywhere as a human being, but particularly in Europe because because I am European and also I mean because I'm I mean I think I mean I grew up in Europe being interested in AI and you know Europe Europe used to be a leader in AI, right? Now now that it's AI is becoming important, they figured out how to basically lose the race that they were ahead in. Not ahead of the United States, but but comparably so. So, you know, I feel, you know, terribly frustrated with this. Also, um the AI Act doesn't come out of the blue. Like the the EU has passed these series of laws like the GDPR and the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act that are all stupid all stupid in the same ways, instead of, I mean, like, nobody, I mean, like, nobody can name, you know, GDPR is supposed to protect our privacy, it does harm in a whole bunch of ways, you know, it's, it's the cookie monster, right, like, now you have to click on all these cookie authorizations, but, you know, that's that's the list, list of things, right, anybody who has a, a small company in Europe, in tech, and not even says, like, oh, the GDPR is such a pain to deal with, right, like, you know, like, I, I called, you know, like, some months ago to, like, you know, to cancel a hotel reservation in Portugal, and I had to listen to a message explaining your blah, 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 and your <laughs> privacy rights, and, like, you know, <laughs> multiply this by millions, like, this is just ridiculous, right, <laughs> so Europe has done a series of these things, but instead of listening to the backlash, they think they're very proud of themselves. You know, the so-called Brussels effect that they pass these laws and then, you know, companies would rather, you know, use them. Uh, um, companies don't want to have one product for Europe and one for the rest of the world. So when Europe passes these laws, as happened with the GDPR, they will often make changes to their product worldwide. So the European legislators are very proud of this. It's the one area where Europe is having a lot of influence. I, you know, I kid you not, like America and China want to be the world leader in AI. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the, the president of the European Commission, the president of Europe, says that Europe wants to be the world leader in regulating AI. Wow, what an amazing accomplishment. <laughs> Is really that what you're shooting for? You're kidding me. <laughs> so I want you to explain a bit for a stupid me and some people that don't know what AI is. We hear this word all the time. What is it? It is it. AI is the automation uh, of things that traditionally only humans can do, of the higher level cognitive abilities, if you will. It's the automation of things like vision, uh, manipulation, navigation, uh, understanding language, and uh, common sense, reasoning, uh, solving problems. And very importantly, learning. The amazing thing about humans or mammals in general is that we can learn. Machine learning is the subfield of AI that deals with automating learning and, and now powers the rest of them, right? So this is what AI is. There's a lot of, uh, uh, this sort of like if you sort of like the lay person's definition of AI. There's, you know, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of hype. It's, you know, it's almost become a vacuous term in some quarters. There is also a more... Um, technical definition, which I actually think is worth knowing because it's very enlightening with respect to some of these things that we've been discussing. And this is that AI is the subfield of computer science that deals with solving intractable problems using heuristic methods. Intractable problems means problems that take an exponential amount of time to solve or, or memory and so on. 
most things in computer science can be done efficiently, like, you know, databases and computer graphics and whatnot. AI, even just playing the game of chess perfectly would require a computer bigger than the universe. So you have to resort to heuristics, rules of thumb, strategies that sometimes will go wrong. This is unavoidable. And AI is the field that deals with this. So if we want to solve problems like curing cancer, for example, we have no choice but to resort to AI techniques, right? But, you know, but at the end of the day, an AI system is just an optimizer. It's just a problem solver. It's not a little agent, a little being with, you know, intentions and emotions and whatnot. That's like, you know, so keeping the real definition in mind, I think, is very important, you know, as, a, as, as even a first step to knowing what you're doing when you're discussing what to do about AI and, and regulating it or, 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 you know, how to use it in your company, etc. And can anyone start AI in 2024? An AI LLM, large language yeah. model? Anyone can use AI and does, right? Anyone can use a chatbot. Uh, I would say there's sort of like maybe three major categories. There's the lay user, which we all are, which use AI every day without even realizing it. When you use the Google search engine, you're using AI. You just don't know it. When you use Twitter, you're using AI because there's a, an AI algorithm selecting the tweets that you see. So we are all power users of AI without knowing anything about it. Now, there's another level, which is where you people who can use and do use today, and they'll be more AI professionally without understanding in detail how it works. Think of, for example, a cab driver, right, who drives a car for a living, doesn't necessarily know a lot of mechanics, right? The mechanics, the mechanics and you know, the engineers know how to deal with that, right? So a lot of these people, you know, and now there can be, of course, a spectrum of expertise there. But a good example of this is a lot of people who do data science. They do modeling of various problems in various areas. It could be biology and medicine. It could be business and economics. It could be a lot of things. They, do, they know AI at some level, but they don't have a PhD in machine learning, right? And then there are the people who do have a PhD in machine learning who are exceedingly valuable and, and costly these days who really know how to build these machine learning algorithms and, and find them and, and you know, develop new algorithms for a problem, for example, as opposed to just using existing ones off the shelf. So you, you could be in any one of these buckets, if you will, and you can, of course, move from one to another. So uh, I'm not sure if you answered that question. Is it easy from uh, one average person to get involved and immediately start his own AI to do something with a goal? Uh, would they have to do something? So, I mean, let me give you an example. Um, you can, an average person can go on ChatGPT and just start asking it questions and asking it to do things. So anybody can do that, right? And they can learn to prompt it and become a prompt engineer, right? There's this new occupation called prompt engineer. So people can do that. Another thing that people can do, let, let me give you an example. There's a little more advanced. So like there's this site called Kaggle that runs machine learning competitions. A company has a problem, like say I'm a, I'm a drug company and I want to do some drug design or like I have some prediction problem. They, may, they publish the data set and they publish a prize for whoever wins it, for whoever, you know, is most accurate at predicting whatever these tumors or whatever they care about, right? Churn, you know, in, in, a, in insurance or telecoms or whatever, right? And anybody can enter that competition. Anybody, you or me, right? And they can use off-the-shelf algorithms to do it. In fact, most of the time, that's what people do. And, and if you win, you win. And if you win a bunch of these things, you become a Kaggle Grandmaster, and, and, and you can get hired by, in some cases, like you know the Googles of this world, just on the basis of being very good in Kaggle, with no degree, no anything in machine learning. Right? Of course, you can also, uh, in Kaggle, develop your own algorithms, and you know there, there's a, a gray zone between, am I using off-the-shelf or am I building something from scratch? Right. Usually what happens is that you know, you start with the off the shelf and you play with the various options and at some point you realize you want to extend it, right? So like, this is a very natural path. You can both, you can go from being a 16 year old lay person to being a world expert. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, there was this thing some years ago called the Netflix prize, which was a, the predecessor of a lot of these things. Netflix, you know, has this recommender system that they used to recommend, you know, films uh, uh, and TV shows for you to watch that is really crucial to their business. Three quarters of the things that people watch come from the recommender. And, and at one point, their machine learning people said like, well, we don't know what else to do. We're already predicting as well as we can. And somebody had the idea of, you know, uh, having a public competition. 
So like, well, we're just going to give a million dollars, which at the time was an astronomical amount of money. This was in the 2000s. And say, you know, anybody who can improve prediction, you know, we're going to run this for whatever, two years, and there'll be partial prices for anyone who can improve prediction by more than, I don't know, one or two percent. And then, you know, the winner will get a million dollars. Okay. And they, the Netflix folks themselves, didn't think anyone would succeed because, you know, it was just too hard. Within three months, the lay people were already beating them. Right. And I have, you know, I teach these evening classes to people, you know, in industry that have day jobs. One person in my, and I gave this prize, you know, a simplified version of it as a class project, right? You know, here's some Netflix data, uh, you know, uh, go, go and predict, you know, what movies people want to watch. And there was one guy there who didn't know any machine learning before. He knew some computer science, so he was not a complete lay person. But he, he did that and then he got interested. And, you know, a few months later, he was in one of the winning teams of Netflix, of the Netflix prize. So he went from knowing no machine learning to being one of the winners in, I don't know, six months. So it's definitely possible. Uh, and you wrote this book uh, that was very successful about AI in 2015. What you got wrong about it? Because uh, a lot of years passed. Well, honestly, to give you a very honest, maybe self-serving answer, I don't think I got anything wrong about it. Uh, I, I, I wrote... so. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, eight years have passed and a lot of new things have happened. Uh, there's a lot of new developments, particularly related to deep learning, obviously. Also, I had the chapter about, you know, what's going to happen in the future. And, and uh, the chapters that are about AI and the different types of machine learning and whatnot, all of that is current. Uh, because I wrote it with that in mind, I was like, I want to write a book with things that will not be outdated tomorrow. Right. And I, you know, and again, the interesting thing about machine learning and AI is that there's new things by the day, but the basic ideas haven't changed since the 50s. <laughs> there are key ideas in machine learning that, that have been there since the field began. Right. And, and, you know, and of course, I try to focus more on these things. The chapter that, uh, you know, if I had to say where I, you know, uh, went wrong in some degree was like I predicted some things that happened to a much greater extent than I imagined. So I thought, you know, like these companies are doing this and trying to keep AI under the hood and, you know, hoping to fly under the radar and this is going to blow up and then people are going to call for restrictions on AI and whatnot. And I'm telling you, this is coming. Wow, I had no idea just the scale uh, it, it, on which that happens. So if I erred on anything in that book was in just, you know, underestimating how big, you know, some of the um, reaction and the backlash and the changes would be. And uh, a curiosity about the book. So the book is selling uh, not better now than it did in the start because of the relevancy of the uh, event or no? So the book had a very unusual sales trajectory. So the book by now is a worldwide bestseller. It's been published in maybe, I don't know, at least a dozen countries. It sold over a third of a million copies, which for a nonfiction book is, is pretty rare. Uh, in the beginning, it, it wasn't, I mean, it reached the bottom of some bestseller charts, but it wasn't a huge bestseller. And, and, and I can understand, because like, this is a book about algorithms. All the publishers are like, algorithms, like, why would anybody care about algorithms? And I'm like, trust me, people will care about algorithms. Uh, and, you know, again, now, now, now nobody questions that. But it wasn't an obvious, like, you know, bestseller. But I think it, 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 it sold a lot, largely on word of mouth. And people who wanted to learn more about machine learning, and, you know, they don't, they're not going to read the textbook, right? And this is just on a different level. This is for, like, you know, one of the, pictures I had in mind was like, you know, a 16 year old kid, smart, you know, 16 year old kid. Another one is the CEO. I'm the CEO of a company. I need to get on top of this day. I think I'm not going to read a, a thousand page machine learning textbook. It ain't going to happen. Like, so like you know, machine learning for CEOs and indeed a bunch of CEOs, um, you know, for example, Jensen Wang, who's not very famous because NVIDIA is not very famous, but back then wasn't. This was when they were about to make their pivot to AI. He told everybody at the company that they had to read the book. Very smart on his part. It's like he was, you know, they used to do computer graphics. It's like, now we're going to do AI. People read this book. Everyone has to read this book, right? I had many sort of like people from NVIDIA companies so like, oh, wow, I read your book because Jensen made me. Uh, but, you know, but this spread the word a lot. And then the book never, books usually sell well for a few months and then they kind of disappear. The book has continued to sell well, you know, and even now, right? 
it's not selling as well as it did at its peak, which again was maybe, I'm going to say like six months after it came out again, as opposed to like the following week. But it's still selling at a, at a steady clip, which I think is remarkable given, you know, how fast moving AI is. What do you think you did uh, right on the book? Is it, uh, by the way, uh, I want to compliment you. You are explaining things very well. You are an amazing communicator, but I'm curious to see if that's what you think uh, you did right on the book. As I think uh, I, I think I did a few key things right in the book. I also made some choices uh, that I could have made differently and, they, and might have been better. I think... Uh, the most important thing was writing that book at that time, right? I had the idea of writing a popular book on machine learning since a popular science book, if you will, on machine learning since I was a PhD student, because, you know, I've read many popular science books. I like the genre. When it's well done, it's very useful and, and fun. And it was clearly even writing the 90s when I was a PhD student that machine learning was becoming very important and someone should write a popular science book about it. And I only saw, and I, nobody ever really did that. There were various books of like data science, this, but like I was very dissatisfied with all of them. The thing that finally this, this, you know, made me decide to write the book was two things. This was around 2010, 2012. There was this big wave of hype about big data, right? It was, m machine learning under the name of big data was now, you know, in newspapers and whatnot. And the sheer amount of incorrect information was just like, ah. And the mistakes, like companies like wasting years and millions or more of dollars on on just like stupid projects that, you know, if they'd read a simple book, they wouldn't have. I'm mean, like, somebody needs to write it. The other one was the idea of the master algorithm. Because like, when you write a popular science book, it's not a textbook, right? It has to have a theme and a thread that keeps people interested. Otherwise, they'll put it down, right? When you write a textbook, you have a captive audience. The students have to read it to pass the exam. Popular science book, you know, it's like a novel. If you're bored, you stop reading it, and then the rest is wasted, right? And and the master algorithm, that's when I had that idea, right? It's like the master algorithm is this idea of a, a single algorithm that can do everything, which seems like magic, right? Like how could one algorithm do, you know, drive a car and play chess and do medical diagnosis, you know, at, all at the same time? One algorithm can and does, uh, in particular, for example, backprop is behind all of these things uh, by training on the appropriate data, right? And this is really the idea at the core of machine learning. The reason, the thing that's so exciting about machine learning is that you can write one algorithm that will be good for an infinity of different things. So I thought this is a great thread to organize the book around. I think that was a good call. The third one, uh, and, and I agree with you, was that I put a lot of thought and a lot of, I already knew the stuff, right? I've been teaching it for, you know, I've been teaching it for over 10 years when I wrote the book. The question is like, how do you explain it in a way that is interesting and accessible to someone who has no background in computer science? So you have to use a lot of sort of like analogies and, 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 and examples and, and put things in a way, this is the key, that is that anyone can understand, but it still conveys the essence. Popular science books tends to either be written by scientists and then it's about their own research and it's like full of overly technical stuff, right? So people don't read it or they don't get it, like they, they don't get most of it. Or they're written by journalists and they're full of mistakes or they're like, they don't really get at the heart of things. So that I, you know, I put a lot of work into that. Having said all of that, I, I did sort of like, I had this determination, which in, in, in retrospect is kind of makes me smile that I'm going to write a book that really covers all of machine learning. Right. I was very also frustrated by like, you know, there are these different schools in machine learning, like, you know, deep networks is one, but there's others. And people tend to, you know, write books as if their school is the only one. And grow up thinking like, you know, deep networks are all there is or symbolic AI is all there is. And this is just bad. Right. So I wanted to write a book that covered the whole waterfront and, and, and at a certain level of detail. So I could have written a book that 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 would be more accessible by not going so deep. It might have had a bigger impact because maybe instead of, you know, 300,000 people, you know, reading it or buying it, there would be 3 million, right? So I deliberately made that trade-off, but, you know, I could have made it otherwise. I also tried, and this really is an art, to write a book that would work at multiple levels. If you're more of a late reader and a quick reader, you will read, you should be able to read enough and then skim some other parts that you got the idea. 
And then there's other parts, usually later in each section or in each chapter, where if you're more, you know, interested and you know more, you can, you know, you can go deeper. So, you know, I had a lot of feedback from people on on, on the book, and I would say that at the it's interesting. At the end of the day, the people that got the most out of it were people who do have some technical background, maybe engineers in another area, or biologists or scientists or even computer scientists who didn't know machine learning before, or even machine learning people who actually didn't know half of the things in the book. They, 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 they can get what's in the book at a level that people who are just reading it, you know, with a fresh mind can. But, but hopefully everybody benefited. The big question, do you think that they have or they will uh, gain consciousness on the way, the machines? Well, first of all, this is a big question indeed. Uh, but the first question within that question is like, what is consciousness? Nobody knows what consciousness is. So since nobody knows, then we can't answer the question, do machines have that consciousness or not, right? So there is what's called the easy problem of consciousness and the hard problem. The easy problem is I can find things that are correlated with consciousness. So for example, there are neuroscientists like Christoph Koch, for example, who what they do is they look for things in the brain that correlate with being consciously aware. Certain neurons firing or certain circuits being on and whatnot. So you can do that. And a lot of progress has been made there. And you can look through those correlates in AI. Right? Then there's the hard problem, which is like, but how do you know that that thing really is conscious? And the truth is that at the end of the day, this is not a question that can be answered scientifically because only objective questions can be answered scientifically. And ultimately, <laughs> consciousness is subjective. I know that I'm conscious. That's in some sense the only thing I know. Right. And I'm willing to believe that you're conscious, but for all I know, you could be a robot. And for all you know, I'm a deep fake of Pedro Domingos. I'm not the real one. Right. So in the end, nobody really can answer the hard question. Now, the way I think this is going to play out is that 99% of the AI systems in the world are not going to be conscious, at least by any, uh, you know, common sense definition of consciousness. And they don't need to be. Right. They're just solving some problem. They're finding a cure for cancer. They don't need to be conscious. There will be some AI systems, like, for example, think of a house bot, right? A robot that, you know, cooks dinner, you know, does the dishes, makes the beds, blah, blah, blah. This robot has to be so similar to humans in terms of their perceptual and motor abilities that it's hard to think of it being able to function without at some level in terms of the correlates being conscious, right? It, it's got to do, it's got to have vision, it's got to have hearing, it's got to manipulate things, it's got to transform one to the other, you know, it's got to process a very intense, you know, stream of incoming information. So at some level, you could say that it must be conscious. Now, but you, but the philosophers could say like, no, 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 this is just some computer circuit that does something that looks like it's conscious, but it's not. And I think that's what's going to happen at the end of the day. In fact, this is already happening is that even prematurely, is that as soon as the computers, the AIs, the robots start acting as if they're conscious, when you look at them, I mean, like, this was the Lambda guy, right? The Google engineer says, like, Lambda's conscious, because it felt conscious. So people will start treating the systems as if they're conscious. And, you know, for the purposes of the lay person, in 2050, AIs will be conscious, the ones they know. Right? And you know, whether or not they really are conscious is, is a question that we, the experts and the philosophers, can debate. The people will just so, treat them as being conscious. So you are saying having consciousness or not is irrelevant if we are treating them as conscious? No, I mean, exactly. I mean, and ultimately, this again depends on your philosophical point of view. Uh, but I think from a practical point of view, it's like AIs are tools. And the question is what they do for us, right? And if they're doing for us what we want to do for them, then these questions like, do they have consciousness? are really not, you know, like, what I care is whether the machine found a cure for my cancer and saved my life, or whether my house bot does my chores for me or breaks down, right? Well, now, it does become relevant, you know, uh, there is one important point to you, which is, and again, you see that today, there's already a lot of people saying like, oh, AIs are going to be conscious, therefore they must have rights. So there are some people who say, if they're not conscious, they don't have rights, but if they're conscious, they have rights. So at that point, this is not just a philosophical question because you have to decide whether they do have rights or not. My position on that is that you must be insane if you think machines should have rights. I already think that animal rights is a bit of an oxymoron. Like, why should the animal have rights, right? It, it makes no sense, right? 
So if animals shouldn't have rights, then machines for sure shouldn't have rights. But there are philosophers, you know, like the Peter Singers of this world that say, well, there's this, you know, like, first we gave rights to other humans and then to animals. And the next thing is we're going to give rights to machines. They're going to have rights because, right? And this to me is like completely um, <laughs> confused and wrongheaded. But there's people who believe that. Uh, so many questions are hard, what you said. But uh, so you don't think animals should have rights? No. So, I mean, like, let me ask you the question. Let's assume that you think animals should have rights, right? Animal, you know, like, there are now laws in the books in many countries, if not most, giving rights to animals, right? What is the rationale for doing that? And again, this is a useful exercise because then what you can do is the parallel of that with machines. Well, are these reasons by which we gave rights to animals? If we, if we don't buy them, then never mind. But if we buy them, then by analogy, should we give those rights to machines as well? You could also think that, like, if at the end of the day you don't want to give rights to machines, you have to be very careful about what basis you give an rights to animals on because it's a slippery slope. So tell me why animals should have rights. Well, because we don't know, if, like, I don't know if you are conscious. We don't know if they are conscious. And if I kill them, uh, why I don't kill you then? If I kill a no, chicken. Okay, so, what you're, so, so to rephrase your argument, you're saying, like, well, animals are similar to humans, so they should have similar rights, right? But again, this is a very slippery slope, right? I can pick up anything that's similar to humans and say, well, this thing should have rights, right? Like that, that, that you know, similarity is a very squishy, very vague concept, right? The, the question is, and again, this is a machine learning question, is like, and where, where do you draw the boundary, right? There's all the things in the world, you know, including rocks and grains of stone, of sand and, you know, plants, right? Uh, plants are living beings, right? Why shouldn't they have rights, right? There are some crazy people who think they should, right? And the question is like, where do you draw the boundary, right? And, and now you could, to me, the obvious place to draw the boundary because it's other humans. The jump, it's not to say that there aren't similarities to animals. Of course there are, but the jump for humans to animals is huge, right? But now, there, and you could also say, but now, like, but there's a deeper reason, right? Which is, you could say, right, as somewhat implicit by, by what just is like, I'm the only one who's, I know is conscious, so I'm the only one who has rights. I shouldn't have rights. I, Pedro, you know, you should, right? Uh, so now, good luck enforcing that. If you're the king of the world, then maybe you can enforce that. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Right. You can believe whatever the heck you want. Right. Now, to me, the real question, and this really is the main point, is that there is no philosophical answer to this. What you need to ask is like, what is for the greater good? Right. You compare to societies, which one will do better? One where people have rights or one where they don't. And I would say, you know, glossing over a lot of philosophy, that a society where people have rights functions better, will progress more, will outdo a society where they don't. Animal rights, I have seen no such useful consequence. In fact, I see a lot of negative ones. But this, I actually think, in some ways, it boils down to an evolutionary question. Right? In my mind, everything is subject to evolution, including ideas like human rights that didn't exist and could go away again. And, and you know, in the struggle for survival between societies, right? like the Nazis didn't believe in human rights, we did, but we won. Right? Was that an accident or did it have something to do with the fact that we believe in human rights? Right? So I think that is, that is the, 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 the only sort of like way to discuss this question that doesn't get mired in sort of like a philosophical bog. Uh, I'm curious to, so I saw a robot in real life uh, and, and I was talking to it uh, and it was one of the craziest experiences of my life. It's, it's it's easy to see it on a video. I saw so many videos before, but actually talking and communicating with a robot and AI, it's uh, it was a striking experience. So that got me really thinking about uh, friendship. Yeah, I wanted to uh, impress the AI. I was saying smart things. I was asking smart questions to make it. Uh, also, I was thinking, wouldn't it be cooler to get married with a robot instead of a human? <laughs> so I'm curious to hear what you think about all this thing and the future no. of this thing. Well, so first of all, all of these things are already happening and they will happen more. There are people who say they fall in love with chatbots. Ten years ago, there was already a chatbot in China called Zhao Weiss that has the persona of a teenage girl. 
And, you know, 40 million Chinese teenage boys have said they're in love with her. This is not one or two crazy people, and it's not today. It's not ChatGPT. This is 10 years ago, and it's tens of millions of people. Right? And now, and, and, <laughs> only, and, you know, and there's companies that, for example, produce sex bots, right? And they're getting better. And there's there's serious scientists, you know, at places like MIT, for example, that say like, yeah, you know, humans are going to have relationships with robots, and it's on balance a good thing because, you know, we'll be less lonely and whatnot. And again, this gets back to my earlier point that like when you talked with that robot, I agree, it can be an uncanny experience, and you were projecting onto it all of these human characteristics that it does not have. You are interacting with it as a human. But people will do that. To some extent, they will learn to not do that when they see how they really aren't, you know, like real humans. But to a large extent, they will. And, and now you can say, uh, and it's unavoidable, and you probably shouldn't fight it. You can ask yourself, is it for the better or for the worse, right? And some people say like, oh, what a horrible thing, people having relationships with robots. What could be more, you know, sad, right? And I, again, I, I, I'm i practical about these things, right? If you're like some poor, you know, incel who's given up on women and is going to not have a relationship with anybody their whole life, then maybe having a relationship with the, with the, with the bot of some form it will actually make them happier and a better citizen and whatnot. So, you know, who am I to judge, right? Go ahead and have a relationship with a robot, right? In fact... I can well imagine a future, not tomorrow, because you know the 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 the, the, t the technology isn't there. Where most people, their partner is a robot, and they look at the you know and they they have a, they, you know they you know imagine this scenario right like every most people have as a partner a robot right designed to their liking that you bought like you can buy a car and then they do everything for you. They're your romantic partner. They're your slave. They 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 are they are they are a search agent. They're like you know they just do absolutely everything for you, right? Including sometimes challenging you again. Part of why Shell Weiss was very smart was that sometimes you know like you you say like oh I had such a hard day. Sometimes she commiserates and sometimes she's like oh man up, right? So so how you do that? I think there will be a lot of competition among the producers of this to figure out like the most engaging. But like at the end of the day, most people are gonna live with a robot. And they're going to look at the poor schmucks who still live with another human being with equal rights and all those kinds of like, oh, my God, like, why do you put yourself through that misery? It's like, you know, maybe the Amish will still, you know, have human partners. So I could see that happening. <laughs> wow. By the way, I'm, I, I really I got to understand the rhythm of thought that you had during the podcast. You always ask, is this going to help? the humanity in the future and you re and can you tell me more about this uh, rhythm of thought like you when you want to solve a problem you ask this question so i found that very interesting no so i agree with you and in fact i i, I try to do that i think we all should do the following right like when we when we for example let's say you're deciding what to do with your life right what are you going to major in what profession are you going to go into what project will you work on you want to do something that you will enjoy, right? So that's that's good. But that's a very under-constrained thing. I enjoy a million different things. So where things get interesting is like, you shouldn't, I'm always telling this to my grad students, don't just pick the first research project that you like. Try to pick the one that has the biggest possible impact. This is what makes us so great as humans can look farther ahead. Right? A dog doesn't look years ahead. They just can't, right? But we can and so what you do is like you said, like, so what, you know, what is for the greater good? And unfortunately, we humans have in us a lot of things from evolutionary time that kind of tend to sabotage us. Like we actually have tendencies that were maybe good a million years ago, but not now. So you have a conscious reasoning mind to overcome the, those, you know, it's the marshmallow test, do things for the short term pleasure that actually, you know, bad for you in the long term. So you can overcome that. And we should make all these decisions from the personal level to the policy level to the whole society level. Like, you know, should you go to war, right? A bunch of people will die, but maybe it's worth it because, you know, in the end, you know, many more people will be happier, free, et cetera, et cetera. So you should always be trying to do this. Now, technology and AI in particular are very, um, you know, sharp proving ground for this because there's a bazillion things that you can do, most of them wrong, right? And, and uh, you're right, I'm always trying to do this. So like, well, there's all these questions and analogies and hand waving, which is okay, but at the end of the day, you gotta ask, okay, we have this choice between us. Should we regulate AI, for example? 
or, 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 you know, what machine should we make? You should reason back from uh, what will be for the greatest good of the greatest people. And if you do that, at the end of the day, you'll do much better than if you don't do that. But it takes a certain discipline, right? This is something that I don't think it comes naturally to people, you know, including myself. You have to train yourself to think like this. Interesting. So now you're elevating and you're saying maybe when you have a path to choose or a decision to make and you are between some paths, you are asking what path will have uh, also something that I'm good at and all these things, but greater impact in the world. And that's most likely the right path. Yeah. You have to think about the people do things too much without really thinking the consequences through and without thinking far ahead enough. So for, I'll give you a very simple, concrete example. People in both uh, you know, research world and in tech companies, they're often working on things that, you know, say, say for example, you're doing a PhD, right? It takes five years. Don't work on something that in five years time will be outdated because Moore's law has made it irrelevant. You gotta be doing research for the technology that will be there when the research is ready. Which if the technology wasn't moving, wouldn't matter. And in some cases that's okay. But in something like AI, right? I think one of my complaints about a lot of what's happening today is that like everyone is sort of like converging on like doing all these tweaks on LLMs, right? Which in 10 years time are gonna be completely irrelevant. Because like LLMs will be outdated, it didn't matter, right? So like think further ahead. Right? And for example, someone who actually, I, I saw recently like a snippet of an interview that he gave that did this very odd thing was Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, you know, said like, you got to start working on something before the technology is really there. Because if you only start working on it when the technology is there, you'll be late to the game. But if you're too early, then, you know, then you're going to fall flat. So you got to be doing this thing of saying, well, I'm going to do this. It's going to take five years. And I hope that in the meantime, with five years of progress, the technology will be there. And then you're the pioneer. Of course, things can go wrong, right? But you got to try to make that projection and, 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 and continually update it. And that's how you do things with great impact. It's not just like, oh, what is a cool thing to do today? Let me go, you know, do some better prompt engineering, right? Five years from now, probably no one will care about prompt engineering. Or maybe they will, but then that should be a rationale. It's like, I really think that prompt engineering is going to be super important. And so that's what we should focus on. So I think doing that thinking ahead is very important. I want you to do a small exercise with me and try to imagine uh, the future in some areas, like it's politics uh, with AI. How, like, how does a government looks with AI? And maybe we can touch on education as well uh, after we do this. So I think politics with AI will look very different from what it does today. So f uh, number one, uh, autocracies like China, they're already making full use of AI to control their population better and whatnot. Democracies, unfortunately, so far, they're mostly paranoid about how AI is going to damage democracy which again, this is, doesn't make any sense to me. There's gonna be all this disinformation and whatnot, like we already have this information. Why? The bottleneck is your attention. What we really need to do, and unfortunately not enough people are thinking about, and this is going to happen sooner or later, is how do we make democracy better with AI? The way democracy works today made sense in the 18th century. You vote once every four years. It's like, you know, the number of bits information that you send to the government per year is close to zero. It's less than you send to Google in a minute by clicking on things. It's ridiculous, right? And uh, voting is just like Churchill said, it's the best system apart from all others, but with technology, now we can have a better democracy. What would a better democracy look like? For example, this is one, one of the sections in the last chapter of the Mass Aragon is precisely about the future of politics and democracy, right? What would that look like? For example, you can have models of people. For example, Netflix has a model of you to recommend movies, which serves you very well, right? A lot of people go like, well, like Netflix is this uncanny ability to guess things that I'm going to like. It recommends something like, I don't think so. But like, you know, I got a subscription. Let me watch an episode and go like, wow, I love this. And, you know, it's like some BBC TV series from the 70s that you never heard of, right? Now, politics, right? Your representatives 
should know what you want. It's their freaking job to do what you want. They're representing you, not themselves. But part of the problem is that they actually don't know you that well. And you're suspicious maybe also of letting them know too much. But what they should be able to have with your consent or to the extent that you want, right, is a model of who you are, what you believe in. You know, are you pro-choice or, 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 or pro-life, right? Or, or, or at a deeper level, what are the considerations that are important to you? What are the things that you care about, right? And not just sort of like on the top 20 questions like, you know, pro-gun, anti-gun or whatever, right? But like, you know, what really affects you? And then they can, as people already do in other domains, when they're about to make a decision of whether to vote for something or to propose a legislation, they can run it by the models of their constituents and see what the constituents think. And then what happens is this apparently magical thing, which is you now have a lot more influence in what the politicians do without spending a lot more time. People don't have time for politics, right? It's like, I got a job, I got a blah, blah, blah. I don't have, you know, like, you know, like the week before I figured out who to vote for based on a few ads or things that I saw. This is terrible, right? You got to make it easy and effortless for people to inject their preferences into, into politics because that's what democracy is. And machine learning allows us to do that. So this is just one example. So I think a, a more... A, and, you know, and then, of course, the politicians could use this to manipulate you, but you're also going to have other organizations. I can have watchdogs, I can have media, I can have journalists that also have their models and go to the politicians. Ah, look, you know, you're promising one thing to Pedro and another one to Phidias. How come? Right. So so everybody is going to be an ecosystem. It's politics today, like everything is an ecosystem with the politicians, you know, like the, the journalists, the everything, right, the activists. You, it's still going to be an ecosystem, but every part of that ecosystem is going to have AI at their disposal. They're going to have models of themselves and of others. And these models, a lot of the talking is going to happen between the models without, you know, even the people intervening, because they can just do it a thousand times faster at a thousand times greater volume, right? And then some things, they have to push them up to like you. They're so important and so unclear that, you know, it really comes, you know, down to asking you. But those will be the exception rather than the rule, right? So again, this, this you know... Um, uh, I, in, in, in the master algorithm in that last chapter, I called it a society of models, right? A society is a bunch of like, it's like, you know, if you're a very rich person today, you can have a thousand people or maybe a hundred people working for you, right? In the future, you will have a million people working for you. Some of them will be your own permanent activist that is always in touch with the agents, AI agents of your senator or your, you know, member of parliament or whatever, right? So these are things are going to work in the future. Uh, so, uh, generally you agree with the concept of democracy, but you think it can be done more efficient or uh, because maybe we give power to the people, maybe it's not good because the average person is stupid. So a uh, very good question. So I am a Democrat. I'm a very, very strong believer in democracy. Uh, but what we have to realize is the following is that the the struggle between democracy and autocracy or other alternatives is perennial it existed in greek times uh, it will it will exist forever and the, and this is the key is that technology changes the nature of that struggle when new technologies come along i mean you couldn't have countries with votes before because you know you just couldn't right like and you know when the american constitution was drafted you know you had to go by horse or by whatever you know from you know, the West Coast to D.C. or not the West Coast, but whatever, other states, right? So, like, uh, and when radio and TV came along, that changed the nature of democracy, right? And and when you look at democracy or autocracy, they each should look, they each will look at how they can best make use of the new technology. So it's not a static field. And the autocrats are using AI. The democracies have to use AI. It is by no means guaranteed that democracy will always win, there's being better and there's winning. I think it is better for a number of reasons. Right? Also, because one of the fundamental reasons why democracy is better than autocracy is that democracy brings more intelligence to bear on the decision-making process. The what does that mean? Let me tell you, because it goes exactly to your point of like, which, for example, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the framers of the U.S. Constitution, this was something they were very even worried, even paranoid about, which is like, you want to give power to the people, but not too much because sometimes they turn into a mob and they're, you know, an uneducated rabble. So we'll let them elect these representatives, but then the representatives are the people, right? So like, 
So this is one view, right? So there's different kinds of democracy. And in a way, what I'm saying is going to happen is that we're going to have other yet different kinds of democracy tomorrow. But in particular, right, I would say that one of the crucial things is like, we do not need, rep we are not, with AI, we're not going to need representatives as much as we did before, because AI can do some of that work for us. Your AI is your representative. And, and the problem that we have in politics is actually in economics and a lot of things is the agency problem. Your representative interests are never quite the same as yours. They want to get elected, they have their own agenda, sometimes they're corrupt, etc., etc. With AIs, right, if you control them enough, which is a whole set of other issues, like you can avoid that, right? And now you can say, like, oh, but the people are too stupid. Well, people today are far less, are far more educated and informed and, and, and knowledgeable and everything than they were 200 years ago, right? And so, for example, I am in favor of having referenda for key issues. Some people think referendums are bad things because then people will vote themselves. Uh, you know, inconsistent things and whatnot, but then it's for the politicians to decide how to make them consistent, right? I think at the end of the day, the big decisions should be made by the people. Also because, I mean, like, again, positions will vary on this, but it's like, I could say, sorry, you're stupid. I'm going to make decisions for you. But my view is like, who the hell am I to say you're stupid? I'm going to make decisions for you. Like, just go to hell already, right? That is so condescending. It's like, no, and I honestly, my fellow academics and experts fall into this a lot. It's like, I know a lot more about economics than this random guy on the street. So the market, this is like the platonic idea, right? It's like, you know, the, the knowledgeable, the experts, the good guys should rule. The problem is that, first of all, then their self-interest, like, the, you know, like your interests become destroyed by mine. So maybe you, even if you're stupid, are better making decisions than me, intelligent, who am not really making them on your behalf. But according to my distorted view of you and my own, you know, prejudices and preferences, right? Number one, right? N number two is that, like, again, people often don't appreciate this. And, and again, AI is going to exacerbate this or, or improve it is I, as one expert, may know more about economics than you as a non-economist, let's say. But that's not the comparison. The comparison is between a thousand experts and a million people. The total intelligence of a million people just dwarfs the total intelligence of even the thousand most smart, smartest people in the world. You know the details of your life and what's good and bad for you way better than I ever can. I don't know anything about your life, right? I may know some economics, laws and whatnot, but, but like my intelligence does not outweigh the individual intelligence of the million people about what's happening in their lives. And what we see all the time, because, you know, today this is an avoid, is like politicians just make bad decisions, often because they, you know, like, look at what happened with Macron, for example, in France, and the Gilets Jaunes. Like, it's like, oh, let's raise the price of gas because save the planet, right? And then a bunch of people in rural areas are like, are you kidding me? I need this car to live. And I don't have money to pay that gas. I don't care about your green blah, blah, right? And this almost brought him down, right? So why wasn't that intelligence in the system to begin with? It should have been. So I think, first of all, I trust people's intelligence more than a lot of my, you know, fellow experts, number one. And number two, again, AI can make this a lot better, just like people today are more informed because you're like reading newspapers is an amazing thing, right? Now we take it for granted, but like, you know, newspapers change, really, really change, like, like, and then so does TV, and then so does the internet, and so will AI. So I think in the future, we will have, let, let, let me... Um, let me give you sort of like a very stark example of this. People hate the idea of important societal decisions being made by algorithms. It's so dehumanizing. Like again, the European Union is full of laws forbidding this. Like, because like, what could be more inhuman than an algorithm that makes some important decision, right? I think there's a. I think it's quite likely that there'll be a point in the future which. We will, we, will, we will be suspicious of any decision that is not made by an algorithm because it's made by corruptible politicians and self-interested politicians. Now, the crucial thing is, I mean, think about it this way. And this, I think, sort of like is a very AI way to look at things, but to me, very enlightening. Democracy is an algorithm. The U.S. Constitution is an algorithm for how to run a country. The European Union Constitution is just a big pile of garbage. It's like a thousand pages that no one ever read. Well, honestly, it's, it's an embarrassment. But buried in there is also an algorithm for how to govern Europe, right? So 
And the algorithm is like this, is like a bunch of people vote, right? And then you, you, you add up their votes, the majority representative wins, and then the representatives in turn, they also vote. This is like the dumbest algorithm that you ever saw. Right? Like, yeah. what a joke of an algorithm, right? But it's better than one guy making, that's an even worse algorithm, like one dictator making all decisions. That is the worst, right? Again, there's a lot of results, both practical and theoretical, that show like voting is, is quite smart in some ways. But we have AI now. We have computers. The algorithm that can make the decisions can be way better than this in ways that we don't even imagine, right? So I think in the future, we are going to want the important decisions to be made by algorithms. And God help us if the algorithm isn't making a decision. Uh, but a lot of people are afraid of that moment because how do you know the algorithm doesn't have an agenda of something? Absolutely. Yeah. So that is a crucial question. Right? You can't be naive and think, oh, again, this is also a trap that people fall into people who don't know computer science, like, oh, algorithms are somehow magically objective and perfect and abstract and like, no. Algorithms do not fall for that illusion. I mean, some of them are, but at least the ones that we're now talking about, they're never going to be like that, right? Al algorithms are creations of humans. We can put whatever prejudices, whatever, like we, I can make an algorithm saying, uh, if this person is black, do not give them a job. Man, that's an algorithm, right? <laughs> and it's biased, right? There's nothing stopping me from doing that, right? I don't, I don't know anybody who has, but they could for all I know, right? So, but also more importantly, and again, you all, you already see this today. Is like, well, I have a search engine that's Google. I have whatever Facebook or Twitter. Are they just choose? They're using AI, right? This is today. Now they're using AI to choose what to show me or what to recommend or, to, you know, like. Are they just doing it for my own best interests? Well, no. I mean, to a large extent, they are because, you know, like it's, it's a non-zero game, right? It's the invisible hand. Google does more business if they actually serve me at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, our interests are not the same, right? They, you know, like, um, why does Facebook have likes but not dislikes? Because likes drive engagement and dislikes drive disengagement, right? I mean, there's, there's examples galore like this. So, these are algorithms, if we have algorithms making decisions for like a society, like I just described, everybody's going to be trying to, to put their thing into those algorithms. Again, we see this in AI today, right? This whole fairness in AI thing is basically progressives trying to inject progressive politics, which I'm not saying I really disagree with, right? It's like fairness is... I'm going, for example, you have AI algorithms now, and this is like, you know, best paper awards and companies like Google and Facebook that have people who do this, like they say, you gotta produce, you know, you know, if if whatever, women are 50% of the population, 50% of this has to be you know, like, the recommendations have to be the same or whatever. Things that to my mind are, are, are crazy, but like you see the rationale, right? It's like, they are injecting their politics into the algorithm. So how do we avoid that, right? One, there's a number of ways, right? But one way that you avoid it is by making the algorithm maximally transparent. So, for example, it's better to have a simpler algorithm in this area, not in others. This is a whole other, you know, uh, can of worms. If I have an algorithm making political decisions, it should be an algorithm that anybody can inspect. Open I source. Say, open source. And there's like, I don't believe that you made the right decision. Let me download a copy of you and, and certify myself that, that you that you weren't manipulated. Or maybe find some like so like there's gonna be whole organizations whose job is to be on top of this process to and like and there's gonna be you know left wing, right wing, like, like pulling in different directions. There's gonna be a never ending struggle just like today about what goes into that algorithm. And and you know, but that's just the way it is. Wow. I love you. <laughs> the next question is uh, about the education. How do you think uh, will unfold with the education? I think education is going to be dramatically changed by AI. And I think most of my esteemed colleagues in you know, both universities and, and schools and whatnot are not prepared for that. But for the students, it's just going to be a fantastic improvement. Now, people have been trying to improve education with AI since the beginning. And it's actually very hard. Because education, unlike, say, recommending a movie, is extremely subtle. For example, when you're teaching a student, you need to understand their misconceptions 
so that you can fix them, which means you need to understand their reasoning process. And so there's this whole field called intel intelligent tutoring systems where the idea is to have an AI tutor. And why not, right? Like this whole mass produced education that we have where one professor gives a lecture to 500 people, this sucks, right? I mean, it's better than nothing, right? But, you know, I, I remember, so like when the whole, you know, online, the whole MOOC, you know, online course thing came out, like a lot of sort of like my, you know, colleagues at sort of like top university saying like, oh, but like, how can this ever be as good as a lecture by me, right? <laughs> and I'm like, buddy, there's like 10 people in the front row listening to your lecture. The other ones are asleep or on their phone. What do you think, <laughs> You are oversampling the people that interact with you and they, and, and they think, you know, and you think they're everybody, right? So where do you have, you know, like, for example, I've talked with Andrew Ng about this. I'm not sure whether Coursera is doing this or it's something that they consider doing, but like, you know, like you take, you have these snippets, right? And then you take quizzes and now you could choose what next segment to show automatically using machine learning by the error that you made in answering the quiz. I can say, oh, this is what you're struggling with. So. This is already making it more interactive than a lecture is. But now imagine that what you have on the other side is a full-blown chat GPT AI-like system. So for example, Khan Academy, right? You know what Khan Academy is? No. It's, Khan Academy is this very you know beautiful nonprofit that puts out, they were the inspiration. The, they were the first MOOC uh, company um, uh, in, in some sense. They just make these online courses about everything. Started with math. A uh, cell can was like a, a quant uh, and then, you know, had to explain some stuff to his niece and he did it on, on you know, like, you know, with, with, a, uh, with a video and I was like, well, why don't I post this? Went viral. Uh, so, so they already do that. Um, and they have an AI agent, you know, building on, on ChatGPT that does this, right? And if you listen to Sol, it's like amazing, probably more amazing than it really is, but you can see where as the AI improves, right, you're going to get to a point where it's not that the AI tutor, I think, for the foreseeable future will completely replace the teacher. It's that it's going to be more like a triangle, right? There's the student, there's the teacher, there's the AI. And the student, you know, knows what to draw on the AI for, which is going to be most of the time because the AI has the time, right? That's the beauty, right? AI is cheap intelligence. Like you can use it all day long, unlike a real teacher, right? Some things then the, the student or the, t or the AI will say like, no, this is for the teacher. The teacher will have a, um, a whole dashboard of like, and again, that's, you, you see you see examples of this already today of like, okay, how is this student doing, right? Like, what's their report card? What is the AI saying this student is having trouble with or there's one that they help? And then the teacher comes in. So like, so the teacher and the AI work together to, for the student. In fact, all three of them work together. And the boundary of what is done by the teacher and by the AI will change over time as the AI gets better. And as we discover better ways of doing this, you know, there will be a lot of, a lot of experimentation. It's hard for that experimentation to happen in today's school systems and today's universities because they are so conservative, right? The irony of universities, you know, and I've spent my life in universities or almost all my life, is that universities are supposed to discovering new things and research and the future. They are the most conservative change averse organizations in the universe, right? The universe is like worse than a church. It's worse than the military. It's like, you know, in the military at some point, some general says like, damn it, we're going to do this. And people do it. The universe is like, no, nah, like, you want me to improve my teaching? Sorry, I'm busy with my research. <laughs> my, my, my mom started out as a high school teacher, got into teacher training, then got a PhD in sociology, education, blah, blah. She said like the number one reality in any educational reform is that it fails because the teachers don't care. I have this beautiful idea about how to teach things, right? Very well proven, like this is gonna make teaching so much better. The students will learn more. And then the teacher's like, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. I'm just gonna keep doing the things. They pretend to comply if they need to, but you know, they're human like the rest of us. AIs guys aren't gonna have that problem, right? If I have an innovation, Right? I push it out to the AI and the AI is doing it, right? It doesn't have rights. It doesn't say, I have the right to say no, right? I want, you know, I'm going to call my union to see if you're allowed to do this. No, it's an AI, right? And so what we're going to see, I think, in the indications are the things are like, and it, it's interesting because you always see a lot of these, like there's these pods of like groups of children, like that happened during the pandemic, right? Parents got together to recruit some person to teach their children. I think you're going to have a lot of this and, and it will involve more and more AI. And then the things that work, will spread just like they do on social networks today, right? 
There's not going to be a top-down process like, wow, you just found a great new way to teach people about, you know, the Gaussian distribution. So now I copy it. I give it to my AIs. Maybe then it gets adapted. And then maybe some guy in India adapts in a way that works better for Indian students or whatever, right? So you're just going to have an education system that is way more customized to the student than, than today. But also where the, if, let's say there's some innovation that like you just came up with right now, right? Uh, you, you know, you know, today's AI saw can, right? And it really works, right? You know, and before you know it, everybody's doing it all over the world in a way that just can't happen today because it, it'll be the AI is doing it for the most part. So, so this, I you, think, is the issue. So you mentioned so, so many times the AI, but I don't think you referenced the AGI in our conversation. Can you touch why? Uh, yes, it, it, you're right. I haven't, and it is for a reason. Is that AGI is a very so? What is AGI? Right? AGI is artificial general intelligence. And now, why does that term even exist? Right? AI is AGI. So why put in the G? Right? The founding fathers of AI, their goal was to replace human intelligence. In fact, they were very optimistic. Right? Back in the 50s, they were saying within 10 years, humans, will, computers will be better than humans at everything. I kid you not, right? So, so we're 50 years behind, but, but okay. Uh, maybe that's not such a big deal in, in, the, in the long, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, right? But then what happened was that AI turned out to be a vastly bigger, harder problem than people thought. And it got specialized into a huge number of different things. Like, you know, I got my PhD in classification, which is a subfield of machine learning, supervised learning, where you have examples with labels about what is the right answer. And in natural language, there's syntax and there, there's parsing, blah, 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 right? So people got very specialized. And as in any field, the specialists weren't talking to each other anymore. And a bunch of people, not AI researchers, uh, um, or at least mainstream AI researchers, they got frustrated with this. This was like maybe 20, 30 years ago. I was like, no, we need to get back on building, you know, human level AIs, AIs that can do everything, right? The AIs, for the most part, until recently at least, any one AI would be very good at one thing. It's like, I just built you an AI to diagnose lung cancer. It's very good at finding the tumors, but it can't do anything else. So we had a growing number of subfields, not really talking to each other that much, and a growing number of very narrow applications that I was good at. And the idea of AI is like, no, we need to get back to having general AI. General being meaning that does everything a human does, right? And now, until recently, this, my, sorry, my personal goal from when I was a student has always been to build, you know, AI in the human, not a, not a human level AI, superhuman AI, right? That's like, we want, like, my, one of my motivations for doing AI was that, like, human intelligence, like, is clearly so limited, like, so, like, I mean, we got to do better than this, right? Maybe back when there was 200 of us in the tribe, that was okay, but, like, in today's societies, our intelligence is just, you know, woefully inadequate. So like, you know, AI, right? So that was always my goal. But you got to be realistic about that goal. And the thing about a lot of these AGI folks to, you know, maybe paint them with too broad of a brush is that they're a little flaky, right? And like these crazy guys who are like, ah, you know, like, I, you know, AGI. And then the really I just go like, yeah, buddy, like come back when you have something to show us, which for the most part, they've never had, right? Like yeah. now. The exciting thing about the last decade is that these labs like DeepMind and OpenAI came along, right, who are populated by these people who are the AGI crazies, right? And not surprisingly, they've been making the progress that the others haven't because they've been trying, right? You can't succeed unless you try, right? Now, what has changed, right? What has changed is that 20 years or even, I mean, like, 15 years ago, I gave a talk at the Symposium on the Future of AI, where I said, nobody's really doing AI research yet because we don't have the computing power to do it. We work on like these very things like, you know, image classification, that's not vision. Vision is working on real live video, but nobody has the power to do that. But 10 years from now, like if you look at how the computing power is changing, we are going to be give or take at the point where we have the power to do real AI, and that's when the real action will begin. Well, guess what? We're there now. Real AI has started now. Like, you know, like those fifty years were a preamble. The real AI is, is 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 starting now, and therefore those guys who used to be the AI crazies now they actually you know they they have something to show, right? 
and and like and talking to people about you know AGI is no longer seen as silly within the field, right? Now, having said that, the, the the there's still a vast gap between the claims that people make and where AI really is, and we need to combat that. These same AGI folks, because they're being true to themselves, they also think that AI is just around the corner. I mean, like Ilya Sutskever, the you know the one of the founders and chief scientists of AI. He told me some years ago, what was this, maybe five years ago, that like one of the things they ask their 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 hires at OpenAI is like, even when they're interviewing them, is like, how far do we think we are from AGI, from human level general intelligence, right? And 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 he says the average was I forget exactly like three years, and I'm like, you gotta be kidding, right? The average OpenAI researcher thinks we're three years away from AGI. This explains a lot of things, right? A lot of the, you know, ridiculous things that you see come from this frame of mind, right? Now, maybe they're right, and I'm wrong, right? Or most of us in the field are wrong, but like, chances are they're just delusional. HEI is not around the court. And so, the lot of discussion that we have today, including about regulating AI and the dangers and la la, is like, it, it, to me, it's happening is kind of like virtual reality. People think like, you know, like, again, Ursula von der Leyen in her State of Europe address this year was like, Europe is saving Europe is saving humanity from extinction with the AI Act, and the rest of the world should follow. It's like, what, what have you been smoking? Right? Any of those lines? How big of a fool of yourself are you making? Right? So, so I think we also need to be careful about you know when you say AGI, the term brings a lot of baggage that I think we need to be a little clear about. Like, AI is already better than humans in some ways, in in most ways not yet. Some things will happen at different times, right? There's not going to be a point at which you say, oh, AGI is here. I mean, you usually have people saying like, oh, with ChatGPT, you know, this year, 2024, you know, like on May 21st, you know, 2024 at 5.54 p.m., AGI will be reached. It's not, it's not going to work like that. So you think the word, that's why in the beginning you said that European uh, laws are stupid about a AI because uh, there is going to be a bunch of AIs, small AIs doing all the work and we're nowhere near the AGI. Okay. Well, that's one reason. I wish there was only one reason the act is stupid, but it's got a real, you know, a treasure trove of reasons why it's stupid. And, and all of the the other... act, in, in fact, most of the AI acts, because, you know, this is a process that took several years, is not motivated by these long-term risks of AI. It's motivated by what are considered the current risks of AI. Right? And in fact, it's interesting, because like the current risks of AI are things like discrimination, disinformation, the jobs apocalypse, right? These these risks don't require AGI to be real. I think they have also in their own right been massively exaggerated, right? That's a whole different conversation. It's interesting for me to see how like the, you could think of them as sort of like the short-term AI risk or the AI risks now and the AI risks tomorrow folks. They're two different sets of people. The AI tomorrow folks tend to be like these, you know, effective altruism, you know, think tank, you know, AI uh, idealist types. The the AI now tend to be sort of like these progressive activists. AI is a cesspool of bias, you know, uh, type. And they're very different kinds of people, almost opposed. And, and they are very much at odds with each other. So like the people who care about AI now risks are, are really pissed about how the extinction risk is sucking up all the oxygen. They're like, stop talking about that crap. You know, women and minorities are being discriminated by AI today. We are being submerged in AI. So why are you talking about Terminator? And the other ones go like, you don't understand. Those problems are small. I'm talking about the extinction of humanity. And I just sit back and eat my popcorn. So yeah, <laughs> there's those two kinds. Uh, so... So I will have one question on this podcast that we ask every guest, and I'm ready to ask it to you. Uh, I give you $1 trillion. How do you spend it for maximum impact, positive impact in the world? Uh, I would, at a high level, what I would do with that trillion dollars is give it to everybody. But I wouldn't just give it to everybody saying, like, you know, here's, you know, you know the... the Whatever a trillion dollars divided by ten billion people, I would, I would, I, so like, if you think about the things that we've just been talking about, right? What I would do is try to set up 
a structure that has this money and where you think of it as a company or a nonprofit that owns those trillion dollars and everybody has a share in it. But the decision process of this organization is of the type that we just described, right? You have to decide, for example, what choices to make, what to invest in, how to spend that money. And the people, and, and now you could spend it well or not, right? So you, if, you sp- if you don't spend your money well, it's gone. But if you and I get together and do something with that money that then becomes, you know, 10 times the money, then you keep it. So, so you know, like, I guess maybe a very short, slightly oversimplified answer to this. You know how, like, you know, there's socialism where everybody owns everything and there's capitalism where the capitalists own everything. But what actually you have, for example, in America today is something much more interesting. It's a kind of like socialist capitalism or capitalist socialism where, like, 60% of the stock, or like, I forget what the percentage is, but like the great majority, so six, sorry, 60% of Americans own stocks. And the great majority of stocks are not owned by the rich people that we're always hearing about. Their money is like, is, is like nothing, right? They're owned by the, the pension funds, by like individually, you know, retirement accounts. It's like, it's like we, the people, actually own the means of production in a way that Karl Marx never imagined. And this is great because we all have a stake it's not like, oh, those companies are evil, capitalists. No, they, they're doing it on my behalf, right? I can complain about whatever Apple does, but I'm an investor in Apple via my index fund, right? This is very, so you want, again, to bring the maximum intelligence to bear, you give everybody a stake. So what I would do is give that trillion dollars to everybody so they all have a stake, right? So like, this trillion dollars is for the benefit of humanity, right? It's not going to be for me. So like, one way to do this would be like, I am the next Bill Gates or the next Elon Musk. You know, I'm going to spend, you know, I'm going to have, you know, the Pedro Dominguez Foundation with a trillion dollars to spend. That's not bad, right? And in fact, Bill Gates was very smart about his philanthropy. He's actually a great example of big being very result driven, very, again, part of what I was described is like, I'm not just going to give some money away. I'm going to try to give it where it has the most impact. Ah, global health is a good one, but I'm just going to give money. I'm going to evaluate the results, right? He gave money for a whole institute at UW, my university, called the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation to see how much interventions are having. And then you put money on the ones that, so that's all good. But even better than that is to have the intelligence of all 10 billion people deciding how to spend that trillion dollars, right? I'm not going to presume that I know what that is. I'm just going to try to set up the algorithm in fact, in computer science, we call this mechanism design, right? A Google auction is a mechanism with a certain mechanism design. A constitution is a, is a mechanism design, right? And, and the question is like, how can we best design the mechanism for this organization so that that trillion dollars will bring the most benefit to everybody? And I think this for sure, at a minimum, will have to involve everybody. It's like you have a share in this. You know, if you want to not care and let others make the decisions for you and vote by proxy, that's fine, but you're going to be losing out. The ones who care, the ones who show up will be the ones making the decisions. Wow, very unique answer. <laughs> it's the first time someone uh, says this. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, at some point, probably, us humans who will be useless. And we are going to have plenty of time to read poetry. How do you think... Uh, we solve this problem? Is it UBS? Is it like, how do, how do you think about this? No, so um, let us look at the following scenario, I think is what you're suggesting. Let us suppose that we reach a point where AIs and robots can do every job better than humans, right? I think there's a very good chance that that point will come. Not soon, but it will come, right? What will that society look like, right? And and what and, and again, this is not a passive question, is what do we want it to look like so that we start making it happen? Should there be UBI? Uh, so so uh, uh, you know, what jobs will people do? Right? So so here are some things that I think um are worth considering. I, I actually think having a UBI is a good idea. A lot of people are very opposed to that because like UBI makes people lazy and blah blah blah. The experiments so far tend to not show that. You give people an income, they put it to good use, right? The, the, the evidence experiments are like, you give poor people a thousand bucks and they invest it, right? It's amazing. They just, just give them, right? So, uh, also, it's one, have... one very good book I read about that, Humankind. 
It's an amazing book about this. Anyway, continue. Sorry for interrupting. Who's it by? Humankind? Uh, Edgar uh, is a Dutch uh, philosopher, I think. I'm not, uh, or Netherlands. I'll, I'll look it up. Yes, I was going to up. put the link of all your books in the description. And if you are coming with a new one as well, oh, I... uh, a book uh, soon. Uh, I have, I've written another book that my agent is currently shopping to publish. So yes, the, it should come out one of these days. Okay, yeah. how off, how soon? We don't know the date. The publishing industry moves glacially slowly compared to the computer industry. So uh, maybe in a year, yeah. I think a year is between a book. Let me put it this way. Between the time when I finish writing a book and when it's in the bookstores, if it's been a year, that's, 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 that's good. It okay. could be several years. And Six it's months a, would be amazing, but that, that's about, just not it. And it's about AI, if I have to guess. It's a, it's a novel. It's oh, a wow. satire of, of AI and, and the tech world. Wow, okay. It's, right. about, uh, it's called 2040, and it's the story of the 2040 presidential election where one of the candidates is an AI. It's basically, wow. you, know, chat, you know, chat GPT runs for president. I couldn't wow. describe it that way when I started writing it, but as you can imagine, the comic potential in this is just infinite. So hopefully, my goal was that, it, I mean, I had fun writing it. The goal is for it to be fun. But also everything in the novel, every element is actually there to try to, you know, uh, inform people or, or for example, uh, I, I want them to see AI for what it really is and the issues. So, so the book also has a very serious intent. So that's, um, you know, that's, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but, uh, yeah, uh, that's, that's my, um, that's, that's my latest book. Sorry. We, you have asked me another question that I forgot. Yeah, to about the UBI and you were elaborating yes. about the picture. Um, I think we should have, let me put it this way. The question that we sh should ask about UBI. Is, so there are many ways to do UBI. Here's one way that I think would be. That I, that I think is the best one is it, it was not you, only about UBI. It was yeah. generally about when we are not going to have nothing to do. When we're going to have nothing to yeah. do. So, so okay. So let me let me do this at a high level first. So UBI is so one. So one question is, if the robots and the AIs are doing everything, how do people get by? Right? How does that income get distributed? Right? And I actually, and I think it's going to be a few different ways. UBI is probably going to be one of them. The other one is that whoever controls the means of production is going to make more money. Right, the people who created the companies that created this AI will make a lot of money, and they deserve to. So I think we're probably going to have a society where there is some UBI, and nobody starves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there will also be people who don't just have a hundred billion dollars; they have trillions of dollars. Your AI might be a trillionaire, and highly deserved because you did something that really is worth a trillion dollars, not just a hundred billion. Right? And I have nothing against that. In fact, I want you to encourage to do that. Right. So, so on the one hand, there'll be, you remember, like, AI is going to increase world GPT, not just by a few percent, sorry, G GPT, GDP, interesting slip of the tongue, by not just a few percent, by a lot, right? So we will have more wealth to distribute. Some of it will go to everybody, but some of it will also see richer people than ever before, and that's okay, right? And the other thing is that um, humans have both sort of like this equality tendency where I want my fair share. But also they have like, and this is in us, it can't be changed, right? Every, we, all, we all know about the totem pole. We like to have totem poles and to be higher on the totem pole than our neighbors. I want to be higher on the totem pole than you are. Even if we're friends, you know, we're buddies, but like, I'm better than you are. I don't tell you that. And you think the other way around, right? Just like Balzac said, the ideal friendship is where each one thinks he's superior to the other slightly, right? So... People are going to, so, so here's another thing that could happen. And again, you also see some of this today, like, look at games, right? I can't imagine a very large chunk of wealth going to the, you know, people by how much they win in some game that they play, right? Completely made up thing, you know, it's like some whatever, you know, next generation, uh, um, you know, pick your favorite, you know, multiplayer computer game. And as you ascend, you make more and more money. So there'll be a very large, by you know, popular consent, there'll be, you know, there will be people are billionaires just because they've, they've, they're very good at playing this game. And people will, will, will come up with ways of doing this, which to us would seem completely meaningless. But again, a lot of the ways in which people get very rich today would be completely meaningless and stupid to the people of 200 years ago, let alone 2000, 
right? You seriously, you get what for sending a ball through a hoop? You must be kidding me, right? So there will be that as well. So there will be all these different ways in which you know the income is is distributed, right? And and I don't so another but another thing that people I also think there will be just as happens with manufacturing today, right? Because things are mass produced, things that are handcrafted have a special cachet, right? So I think even like a lot, this thing was handmade. And often it's way worse than the piece of plastic that costs, you know, two dollars, but plastic is plastic, right? Plastic is very underappreciated. So I think we're gonna have, for example, restaurants where it's like we are a really expensive upskill upskill restaurant, so upskill that we have human waiters and bartenders. Whoa, those are the best. <laughs> so I think there will always be jobs for people, even when the machines do the job better. Right? For various reasons, like prestige and taste and like how our human minds work. So there will always be some jobs for people. There will always be a job for people which is mining the AIs, being on top of them, making sure that they do the right thing. In fact, I think even in this beautiful future, that is going to be everybody's job is to keep making sure that the AIs are doing what they're supposed to do, right? So everyone will have a job just doing that, right? Now, another question that kind of exemplifies what you're saying is we were like, oh, but people's lives will be so meaningless because it's work that gives you meaning and whatnot, right? And, and you know, that resonates with me because my work gives me a lot of meaning. But if you look at people, look at the people who are, you know, independently wealthy or retirees, they're not miserable for the most part. They don't feel that their life is meaningless. They found other ways to give meaning to their life. It's not written in the stars that it's, it, that it's, you know, work that will give us meaning. Like, for example, I like to discover things. And maybe there will come a day when the, when the AIs are way better at discovering things than, than me or anybody, like in whatever, in, in any area. But then I think what I will do is like, I will discover things for myself, right? I will be discovering what the real laws of physics are with the help of AIs who will explain them to me or whatever, right? Uh, for my own enlightenment, right? These days I get to earn a living doing computer science research, but you know, but if I really like to do it, I can still like, I mean, look, look at chess, right? People still play chess. They don't say like, oh, you know, the best chess players are computers, so it's just not worth it, right? It, it doesn't work that way. So I think people will find all sorts of meaning in all sorts of new things and old ones, right? There will be a temptation for people to sit back and watch TV or play video games all day long, and some people will fall into it. And we need to, you know, combat that as parents, as educators and whatnot. But the notion that, you know, in a world where everything is done by AIs, humans will be, you know, miserable and, and have meaningless lives. I just, I don't see how that's going to happen. We're, we're better than that. Why do you do these podcasts? I, well, great question. So, um, uh, which we can answer sort of like very concretely, you know, building on what we talked about before. I get a lot of requests for interviews, you know, radio, TV, newspapers, podcasts, you know, to write pieces like, you know, the full range, right? Uh, you know, basically started when the book came out, there was a lot of interest. Uh, and of course, I get way more than I, way, way, way more than, than I, than I, you know, than I can do. And so I, I try to do the ones that have the most impact, which can be often very hard to guess, right? I mean, um, and impact, so one example is like, you know, if, I don't know, the BBC wants to do an interview with me, I probably will say yes, right? But if a podcast that has a large audience wants to do an interview, maybe I'll do it as well, right? Because, you know, like, I, I don't care whether it's old media or new media, I care about who is it going to reach. And, I also, and, and again, I often will do things for very small audiences because they are very influential audiences or, or for example audiences in a field, subfield of AI that I think could, you know, I could help go in the right direction. Like, for example, you know, a few months ago, I was in Portugal where, where you know, I took place in an event that, that had like, I think, 50 participants and they had a session on AI. But those four participants were like ministers, Supreme Court justices, CEOs of corporations, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know, it's only 50 people, but they matter. Right. So I actually flew to Portugal on purpose to do this. So I use basically the same rule as for everything else, which is, and, they, and then also, this also has to compete with like doing research or writing books, right? Two hours that I spent doing a podcast, accomplish something right there. But when you add this all up, if that's all I do, then I don't do research. And maybe at the end of the day, my research is where the biggest impact is because you need to move AI forward. 
So I try to manage that in a way that, of course, is very heuristic and very fallible, but that's what I try to do. Uh, the way that we end this podcast is by beautiful exercise, which you are going to die after this podcast. And uh, let's say hypothetically after 40, 50 years you die, actually, we're going to uh, look back to this and it will be your last word and a message to the world. So you have 30, 40 seconds, one minute to say your last words. Learn as much as you can. Learning is, is one of the greatest joys in life. And it also makes you a better person. So not only is it good in the moment, it's how we make everything better. You know, Einstein said if he had one hour left to live, and this is always on my mind, he would spend 55 minutes figuring out what problem to solve and the last five solving it. And this is exactly right. You will have the biggest impact if you learn the most. So the first and most important thing is to do is to learn. Not just when you're in school, but your whole life. One of the things that I try to do is learn every day. Learn When you make a mistake, there's a lesson to be learned there. If you learn that lesson, it was for the better that you made that mistake. Because now will, will you, not, you will not only not make that in the future, but you've probably learned a more general lesson that will avoid making other mistakes as well. right? So when you have a choice between doing A and B, and they're both fun, and maybe B is even a little more fun, but with A you learn more, do A. Thank you for your time. You are amazing. Thanks for having me. <laughs>